Everybody hear me okay? And first let me apologize. Some of these graphs for those in the back, uh, I'm glad they're included, but you're going to see why they're going to be very hard to read because there's a lot of stuff on them. And when I say stuff, I want to just thank Jane Wellman because we wouldn't have the type of stuff and data that we have today if it wasn't for what she has done at Ed Education Trust as well as the Delta Call study, which I'd just like to encourage us more and more as institutions to look to this data. We've killed a lot of arguments in Sacramento already, and we've made a lot of progress in Washington because this data is indeed made available. And the CSU has been one of the ones that have been encouraging more and more institutions to admit this data, to cough up this data. Uh, and I'll point out that in the early 1990s, much of this data, when it was first asked to be submitted to the federal government in iPads, there were at least half of the, half of the nation's institutions that objected to the idea of submitting data to the federal government, despite the fact that they were living off federal direct student aid money, uh, loans, grants, and whatever else was in the pool at the time. So uh, as I go into this, I just kind of want, want to start with that. I'd like to thank President Hagen, President Hagen and Millie Garcia. Millie, where are you? President Garcia, hey Millie, you got a good fireball here, and uh, you got a great new president, and we look forward to working with you every step of the way. The data that I'm going to show you today actually makes our case and makes it very strongly. And what Jane does, and one reason Jane is so wildly respected throughout the United States, and the reason she was in the White House Roosevelt Room that day, is that the way, it's a very nonpartisan way she presents this data. Well, I'm here to tell you I'm presenting it in a very partisan way. <laughs> because the data is indeed on our side. It's on the side of efficient institutions. It's on the side of institutions that have remained committed to public missions. It's on the side of institutions that fight hard to keep their tuition and fees low compared to national averages. And it's on the side of institutions who want to make public things that, that Bob Shireman was talking about this morning, which we already do in the CSU. We make our mid-career earnings available. We make our starting salaries earn available. And we, we actually were the first to put our student loan, the average undergraduate student loan indebtedness, on our website, on the college portrait. And we've encouraged the rest of the nation's institutions to do the same. You'd be amazed at how many don't want to do that, by the way. Don't want to talk about their student indebtedness. Don't want to talk about their default rates. That don't want to talk about the things that that Bob fought so hard to try to make them actually report on an annual basis. We'll get to a little bit of that. But if, uh, let me just jump into sort of how we got here. And uh, I, I was very fortunate to, to begin my studies at the Grapevine data. And if you don't know Grapevine, it, it's the main source of higher education state appropriations. It started in 1960 with M.M. Chambers. And it is still housed at Illinois State University. So if you, there's anything you take away, I want to, there are a couple charts I'd like to show you in a second. But the last real great debate we had in American higher education occurred really between 1965 and 1972. And what ultimately ended up is that in 1965, we got the Elementary Second and Secondary Education Act, which is in the process of being reauthorized in Washington right now. One of the most important aspects of ESEA was Title I. Title I said that poor children, schools that have a disproportionate amount of poor children, need federal assistance and extra resources to help educate those children. That's been a widely accepted principle in K-12 schools. Widely accepted principle. Money goes directly to those schools, and it can be used as federal leverage to encourage schools to do certain things, and has been done that way. However, Higher education was treated very differently for a number of reasons. Number one, the American community college system was flourishing, growing. Private higher education was in jeopardy. They made their case very soundly and said that the states will take care of public higher education. If you develop a federal voucher system, a federal student aid system where everybody can play, that the federal government needs to help private higher education stay afloat and keep their pop student populations up. Well, public higher education was against this concept in 1972. We fought for direct institutional aid, much like Title I in 1965 did for poor schools in K-12 district. Well, when the smoke cleared in 1972, the federal government adopted the federal voucher system. But it also adopted the cost of education allowances to appease the public sector institutions. Cost of education allowances 
actually authorized that $2,500 would follow every Pell Grant student to that institution so that we could put that into the programs that help those students succeed. Well, guess what? There's never been any money put into the cost of education allowances. It was authorized in 1972, but no money ever followed those students. So the institutions that took low-income students had to figure out the best way to educate them with no extra resources from the state or no extra resources from the federal government. Very unlike Title I. Very different than the Title I ESEA program. What happened since 1972? Now, this could go on all day, but the public-private battle that happened in 72, the privates won, the market system prevailed in 1972 at the federal level because the assumption was the states are going to take care of the public lower-cost institutions. Demand for student aid changed in 1978. Loan caps were blown off. So many institutions ran tuition up as fast as they could because they could. Many states, Pell has taken over. Pell has become the largest federal direct funding system that we have, uh, $30 billion plus dollars going into Pell. Leverage, SSIG was started to encourage states to adopt state student aid programs. The first real federal leverage issue to encourage states to adopt good programs or state student aid programs because when SSIG started, there were only six states that had direct student aid state programs. Currently, today, there are 49 that have state student aid programs. So SSIG has become obsolete because it served its purpose. Direct lending, as you know, we just recently adopted direct lending. For some reason, the U.S. system thought that it was better to funnel direct student loans or funnel student loans through private banks, unlike any other OECD country has done, we thought it would be a great idea to pad the pockets with risk-free loans of about $10 billion a year to America's banks with risk-free. Only recently have we turned this around, and you ha you've probably read a lot about the fight, but now we're all on direct lending, which provides $10 billion extra dollars to our students to go to college. Perhaps that may be ultimately the best policy that was adopted by the Obama administration when the smoke clears after all is done. This, was, this actually was a fight that started in 1990 that was only recently accomplished. The big issue is that tuition reliance has grown significantly. And Jane, as Jane pointed out, there is an arms race, there is a spending race, and I'll show you what some of those spending numbers are in the private sector. Princeton has to keep up with Yale. Yale has to keep up with Harvard. The spending has gotten so out of control at some institutions that nobody can reel it back in. At the same time, there's this issue that spending is associated with institutional prestige. And if you take a look at U.S. News and World Report, which is the most read national ranking, which could be the worst national ranking for public benefit of anything we've ever developed, 40% of the U.S. News and World Report score is based on how much money you are able to spend on the fewest amount of people. Is that good public policy to follow? And the other is based on selectivity. If you can encourage as many students as possible to apply so you can turn away more than your opposing institution. So that tells you how this ranking system has worked and it's perversely impacted many institutions but perversely impacted the public sector in terms of how our institutions are responding to public needs. This perhaps is the most important issue that we're dealing with. Remember when I said the federal government was going to augment what states did for higher education in 1972. They were supposed to jump in and play a small role in helping students, low-income students, go to a variety of institutions. Well, the states were going to handle the rest of it. Well, currently, states now put $78 billion into higher education. The federal government puts $170 billion into higher education. The $170 billion is tuition-reliant assistance. The $78 billion is institutional support. So if you have been reliant on your state, you're in trouble. You've particularly been in trouble since 1985 and 1990. If there's anything that you take away from this, in this, this graph, you have it in your, in your packets, it's this chart. State fiscal support, and we've been very fortunate, we're closely working with the White House Domestic Policy Group, who's using this data too, that using this data to prove their point, and I'll get to that at the end, that State fiscal support for higher education in terms of tax effort, personal per capita income, per $1,000 per capita income, 
is at its lowest point, state support, since 1965. And as Jane pointed out, one thing this chart doesn't do with the grapevine data is it doesn't factor in FTEs, student enrollments. 1965, we had 6 million students. Today, 2012, we have 20.5 million students in American higher education. This shows you where the crisis. When the loan caps were blown off, the reliance on the state, state reduction started declining. And I've got anecdotal evidence of how legislators have seen this. The, state, the Speaker of the State Senate in the state of Kentucky told me in a parking lot in the University of Louisville, I'm going to get reelected by cutting your budget at Murray State, letting you raise tuition, and you can just rely on the federal tuition programs to offset what we didn't do for you. That's what's going on in California. Let me show you California. Here's California. We're at our lowest point in higher education support and tax efforts since 1962. 1962. This is the crisis for 80% of our students. This is the crisis for public, American public higher education. States are abandoning their commitments as fast as they can. Why? Because they can. There are no federal protections on higher education. There are federal protections on Medicaid through matching funds. There are federal protections on Title I schools, MOE provisions that stop the states from backing their money out of the Title I schools, which they tried to do for the first 10 years, and they lost every court case where they tried to back their money and supplant their money with federal money. The reality of all this is that when we talk about higher education and you read about, there are good and bad players. There are good and bad players with regard to tuition and fees. I'll give you an example. University of Richmond, I think, is a bad player. University of Richmond raised their tuition two years ago, $7,000, because they were getting a lot of Northeastern applications. And their peer institutions were in the Northeast. And their president said, that one reason we're raising it is because we don't want the parents in the Northeast to think we're cheap. That's the Chavez Regal effect in higher education. The bottle looks good, but tastes just as good as anything else. It's cheaper on the inside. The Chavez Regal effect is indeed alive and well with many institutions, not, but also not alive and well on many campuses such as ours who are fighting to survive on the lowest funding sources that we've ever had. There are good and bad institutions in the expenditure race. Princeton raised their tuition over $2,000 this year, about 5%. They had their best endowment year in recent history this past year, upwards of 24%, 25% endowment returns. Nobody has asked Princeton, why did you have to raise tuition $2,000? There are good and bad institutions on the expenditure race. Why does Sarah Lawrence in New Jersey charge more than Princeton? Why does Chapman charge more than Princeton? Is that fair to really assume that the value is associated with what institutions actually charge? There are good and bad institutions, institutional commitment to public goods. What happened in 1972 to win the federal government over? It was stated that Stanford, if federal assistance would be made available to the private sector higher education, Stanford would become like UCLA. What's happened is UCLA has become like Stanford. And Illinois has become like the University of Chicago. Virginia has become like Harvard, not the other way around. In fact, we have seen a decline nationally in service to underrepresented populations, Pell students. Private research universities are down to 12.5% of Pell students they serve. And let me remind you, these are the richest institutions on earth in terms of per-student spending. Public research universities are down to 19.5% Pell eligible. Good and bad states, they're good and bad states. They ask in a committee hearing, is the California master plan alive and well? They ask, I was testifying on this, and I said, yes, it is. It's alive and well, but it's alive and well in North Carolina. <laughs> Where the tax effort of North Carolina is second in the country, and their student fees are 49th. You see the balance? Here, the balance was we're supposed to keep our fees low in exchange for the same type of tax effort, yet our tax efforts at our lowest point since 1962. There is no balance. There is no master plan when that balance is violated. So North Carolina is doing well. 
In fact, there are states that have higher tax effort than California now, despite its wealth. Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, New Mexico, and West Virginia have higher tax effort in support of higher education than California. And I can say this. I, I grew up in Kentucky. I've got family in Kentucky. Kentucky's not a wealthy state, but they're supporting their students better. In fact, in Kentucky, tobacco's still a vegetable. Uh, so there are things that aren't being done in this state that we should be ashamed of. Good and bad funding formulas. Most of our funding formulas are not based on the outcomes that Jane's Delta Call study demonstrates. They're based on what used to happen in higher education. Many states have said, we're going to fund certain institutions to make them a top 20 or a top 30 public institution. What does that mean? I was in Canberra, Australia in 2002, and the first thing out of the Ministry of Education at a question at dinner was, how can we get the University of Melbourne and the University of Sydney as, as top 30 public universities in the world? What will we have to do to do it? And my response was, do you have any idea what you're going to do to the students at the University of Brisbane and the University of Perth while you're chasing an arbitrary top 30? That may not matter in any, any situation. Here's what some of the data that Jane makes available, shows you. She talks about the spending race. Private research universities, this is an average spent, this is what they're spending per student. $105,000, public research universities, 33, private liberal arts, 25, ASCU institutions or master's institutions like ours, which for us, for the larger CSUs, is a real difficult categorization because the average master's comprehensive university in America has 8,000 students. Fullerton has 35,000. We have 35,000. So it doesn't necessarily fit, but our spending levels have been, haven't grown that much over the last 15 or 20 years because of the number of students we've served and the fact that states have backed out of their responsibilities. Community colleges are about 11,000. Now, this is really hard for you in the back to see, but here's where it gets real difficult for us in the CSU. These are the lowest 20 universities in per student spending in America. So when Sacramento says that you're wasting money, you can get it out of your administration, you're wasting money on your campus, higher education is inefficient, I say, yeah, there are a lot of places that are inefficient. But let me, sh when you look at this chart, what you will find of the 103 universities in America, public institutions with 15,000 or more students, the CSU has half of the lowest spending institutions per student in America. Now, where has that gotten us in Sacramento when we said we're efficient, why don't you reward us? Nowhere. Unfortunately, that sells well to some legislators and to some Tea Party members, but it doesn't sell well to our faculty, our students, our, our, our parents. How would you like to be told as a parent, come to our campus, we'll spend less on, on your child than anywhere else in America? <laughs> Cal State Fullerton is fifth, Long Beach is sixth. That's not what you want to hear. Now, outcomes. We spend little, but our outcomes are relatively good in terms of production, degree production. What you'll find is that most of the universities, according to Delta Cost Study data, this is, these are California institutions. And I'll point out, here's Fullerton. To produce one college graduate, this factors in the, the half of the students that we lose, all the cost, it costs Cal State Fullerton $42,600 to produce a baccalaureate degree graduate. Costs Long Beach State, $42,200. You go across the state, the numbers vary dramatically. Stanford, it costs Stanford, cost, $305,000 to produce one baccalaureate degree graduate. It costs UC San Diego $103,500 to produce one baccalaureate degree graduate. My point in all this is that if we are indeed going to support degree production, we need to pay attention to delta cost data. We need to fund the places that are doing it efficiently. And if you want three graduates for the production that we're spending on one somewhere else, you need to pay attention to, this, to these data. Total degrees in spending, as you can see, it on average, nationally, private research universities to produce one college graduate. It costs $203,000.
to liberal arts, 85, community colleges, 70. The reason community colleges are so high is because the graduation rate, the AA degree rate, is only 21% to 22%. This is an issue that community colleges, if they get their graduation rate up substantially, these numbers will come down because they're losing four students for every one that they're graduating, and that, when that's factoring into the cost. Research, public research, 70,000. Our type of institutions, master's comprehensive, 50,000. That's one reason why Jane Wellman was in the president's Roosevelt room, because this data is becoming significant to the Department of Education. It's becoming more significant as we're trying to produce more college graduates. Now, dropping this into the equation, which Delta Cost doesn't do, where are the poor students? You saw the spending levels. The poor students, if you take a CSU institution, 34% of our students are Pell eligible. That's very high compared to the 19% public research institutions. California, UC does a better job than the rest of the research institutions, 10 percentage points higher. Has a lot to do with California demographics. This is sort of our peer group, our peer group institutions that we use for years, 24%. Public research, 19%. Private research, 12%. So what does all that mean? And when you break that down per institution, what you'll find is that of those large institutions, those 103 large institutions, 10 CSUs are among the highest percent of Pell students of the 20 largest, of the 100 largest institutions in the country. In fact, Fresno, as you can see, Fresno State has the highest percentage at 50. Northridge, Riverside, Sac State, we're at 36 percent. Fullerton is at 30 percent. Now, I want you to think about that for a second because that's the difference between ESEA, K through 12 education, and higher education. We don't get any help for that 36%, 34%. We spend less, we get less from the state, we charge less, yet we have the most expensive students. If this were indeed in the K-12 sector, this would be ripe for a state lawsuit that would overturn the funding formula immediately that we've seen in Kentucky in the Rose case. We've seen in Texas, we've seen in Ohio, we've seen in Indiana, virtually half of the states that have had these cases. We're spending less on students who need more through our state funding formulas and we're get charging less because we have those low income students. So the public policy di dilemma is this, universities are the most expensive students charge the least, receive the least state support, and therefore spend the least on these students. Therefore, guess what? Our graduation rates are lower. Now, while universities that have the most expensive, that have the least expensive students, have more resources allocated, that's that chart on spending, they have the least amount of costly students. They have the wealthier students. So, this is kind of where we get to the, the President Obama's proposals. I'm very supportive of what I'm hearing out of Washington. Now, private higher education is throwing a fit because they're screaming cost controls. Well, first of all, costs, we've dealt with cost controls our whole lives as institutions. It's called a governor. <laughs> it's called a state legislature. It's called a board of trustees that doesn't give differentiated tuition and fees. We can talk about the market all we want to. The market doesn't have anything to do with what we charge. State appropriations do. We've had cost controls since day one. They're screaming cost controls because the, because the Obama administration has said that federal first administration to recognize what we've been yelling about for 15 years. Federal student aid is unsustainable. If they keep putting more money into Pell Grants, states keep backing their money out, tuition just goes up to negate the increase in student aid. That's what's happening. States are abandoning their commitments. So, we're very pleased that he is in this budget. He's protecting Pell, which indeed the big battle on Pell will be next year because of the numbers. But the creation of MOE for higher education is vital. MOE, like Title I, can protect what it says, and we had a little experiment with it with three economic stimulus packages. What Bob Shireman and the Department of Education did through language, thanks to John Tierney in Boston, George Miller in California, against the wishes of Lamar Alexander in Tennessee, who railed on the House floor, this one by one vote, that in the economic stimulus packages, 
maintenance of effort provisions were put in there that said that you can receive higher education and education funding only if your state does not cut your budget below your 2006 funding level. 48 governors were against this. Democrats and Republicans. We got Schwarzenegger, he didn't take a position on it, fortunately. But 48 governors, NGA, National Governors Association, completely against this. You know what happened after one year of the stimulus money? 20 states cut their higher education budgets to the very threshold of where the federal, federal penalties kick in. And they wouldn't cross it for two years. Tennessee, with a $1.1 billion budget, despite Lamar Alexander, cut their higher education budget within $13 of where the federal penalties kick in. Oregon cut it within a dollar. Colorado cut it within a dollar. California cut it within $3 million in an $8.9 billion higher ed budget. It didn't matter what we did in Sacramento. What mattered was where the federal government said, you're going to stop if we're giving you money. Now, the Obama administration, what the press has picked up on is that he said, we're going to hold institutions accountable. Richmond, if you're going to play that game, then we're going to hold you accountable for cost increases and tuition increases. But I think this is a good thing because the more information gets out there, the more information on the college scorecard that they're putting together to hold institutions accountable, we already do 80% of it on our public goods page. As I mentioned, we already make this information available. Earnings data, student indebtedness, default rates. All of this, we're making available. 23 CSU institutions have been leading the country in trying to get this legislated and mandated for years. Net tuition was a CSU idea. We were the first to testify that you can do net tuition and use net tuition to measure what an institution actually charges, not what their sticker price is. Extend, this is sort of the hidden student aid that's out there. This is vote buying at its best. The middle class assistance, tuition assistance program. $20 billion in federal, federal government expenditures go into it now. Nobody knows it. In fact, in the CSU, we've calculated that 41% of our parents over the last two years have received almost $2,000 back in tuition tax credits. And that's never been factored into the equation. And we tried to make this, this point to Assembly Member Perez, who wants to create a middle class scholarship program. Well, the federal government has already done this. The parents are getting back $2,000 a year to the extent that $20 billion a year, it will probably surpass Pell in the coming years. As, as a middle class benefit, that will exceed Pell eventually. Working to keep our student interest loans down, which is it's going to jump to 6.8. And these are the kinds of things that they meant that, that sort of normally happen. It's this part. It's creating MOE to pressure states and holding institutions accountable, which the federal government has never embarked on. They can no longer put money on a, on a stump and leave the room. And that's what many institutions are asking them to do. I'll point out that this has gotten so bad, the system has gotten so bad that Bob Shireman, the Department of Education, they've, they've been asking for help. We can't even reel this back in because it is such a free market voucher system. And the authority to give away $170 billion in federal money is not vested in the Department of Education. It's vested in 30 accrediting bodies that have no oversight whatsoever in what has been going on. And there are 178 for-profit institutions operating in California right now that live off public money. That live off public money. They're trying to change a 90-10 rule in Washington which says they have to at least get 10% of their money from other sources than direct student aid. Just to tell you how bad it's gotten. And to show you, they want us to, they want us to rethink our state student aid programs. And when we made this information available, we have our own state student aid programs that are funding these institutions in a similar voucher way. All you need is accreditation. Well, everybody knows that accreditation is about as easy to get as anything today. We have dropped the ball on accreditation. And accreditation made a key mistake by saying, re responding back to the Department of Education when they said, it's not our job to police these institutions, it's your job. There's nobody policing these institutions to the extent that in this state, it gets worse. Your Cal Grant program, a $600 million program, well, that's chart. this chart is probably maybe in your packets, but what it shows is Kaplan Institute of San Diego, the same student that goes to Cal State Fullerton will get $4,000 in a Cal Grant award. 
If they choose Kaplan of San Diego, they've got $12,100. They choose Expressions College, they'll get $12,500. If they choose the University of the United States of America, which sits in an industrial park outside Long Beach, they'll get eleven five. There has been no oversight in where this money has gone. So the federal issue about it's unsustainable is our issue too. Our state funding formulas are unsustainable if we're throwing money around like that and we're not rewarding the institutions that are doing the best for the public good. So I encourage all of us to use this data to our advantage. If they want efficiency, let's look at efficiency. If they want low cost, let's look at low cost. But let's talk about funding if your priorities are to produce college graduates with good degrees, with low indebtedness, with low default rates, then let's fund those institutions that are doing the best job possible. And that's what this data clearly shows to me, is that there are bad players in this system that need to be reeled in, and there are good players that need to be rewarded, and there are good and bad states. And California is among one of the worst in terms of its abandonment of higher education. There are 12 states that have abandoned higher education, the worst during that period. California is one of the dirty dozen. And if we're gonna be committed as a wealthy state to supporting our students, we need to rethink how we're funding higher education and reward the institutions that are doing a good job and doing what the public wants them to do. Keeping expenditures relatively low, keeping costs relatively low, keeping student indebtedness low, all of the things that matter to our taxpayers, all of the things that matter to our students and our parents. So we're in this. All higher education is not alike. And when you hear that privates are like publics, and you've heard colleagues say this, publics are like privates. Some are. Virginia is like a private. University of Virginia, according to the legislators in Richmond, Virginia, is known as the University of New Jersey at Charlottesville <laughs> because they're 40% out of state. They're simply turning away in-state students, not serving in-state students, not serving Pell students. They have privatized along with Michigan and a number of other institutions. We don't have that luxury. We don't have the finances to do it. We don't have, we don't have the luxury that many of those institutions have to do that. So I would encourage us to be very supportive of federal <laughs> intervention into this because our own Pell Grants are at stake. When we can't control the number of institutions that are getting Pell, I'll give you this data. For-profit institutions in America today have 11% of the student population, 30% of all the Pell Grants, and 47% of all student loan defaults. That's a red flag. That's a big red flag that we need to work together to show who's good and who's bad in all this. So I thank you very much for your time and I look forward to your questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I was gonna ask some longer questions but I'll try to keep them to a min very minimum so that the audience can ask questions. We will go to 1140 for the discussion session. So. I guess it cuts your lunch. You'll have to eat quickly, I guess. Um, I come from a family of educators. Five of my brothers and sisters are in education. So I was going to ask you a question, but rather than doing that, um, we do have two founding documents for our, for our country. Uh, let's see, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I think the Constitution is actually more important. The first few lines of that are that in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Uh, I would suggest, and I think uh, President King mentioned this at least once in his, in his presentation, uh, that education is the most important of these sort of elements that go to the ge general welfare and what economists do call a public good. Uh, we have to admit that there are some really private benefits from education. I mean, we know that if you have a PhD or a master's degree, your income tends to be longer over your lifetime and will higher over your lifetime. We'll hear more about this later this afternoon. Uh, but that's part of the issue. We do have, in the middle of this political uh, time right now, leading up to the election, some candidates saying government should get out of education altogether. Uh, I don't think that's President Alexander's approach. Uh, but 
that's part of the discussion that we'll have. So I just have a few quick questions. Uh, and I'll ask them first and then, and then let, let our uh, respondents go. Uh, for Jane, you present the data evenly, fairly, and in a relatively easy way to understand. Part of the intent is to do so in a non-biased, non-partisan way. That's good. My question has to do with letting the data speak for itself. Many of us who do work in statistics look at lots and lots of data and we're overwhelmed with it, but then after a while we do see, hey, the da data is saying something to, something to me. So I guess my question for you is, what does the data say to you? All right, you've said some of this, but maybe putting it short. So you can think about that. Uh, maybe it says nothing. Uh, second question, just really, uh, would you advocate for a pet benefit for the CSU system? <laughs> uh, I have two cats, they're expensive. Uh, for President Alexander, uh, I had a much longer question, but I'm just going to jump to this. Uh, perhaps you're preaching to the choir. We're all, at least the large majority of us here are at Cal State, and we would say, hey, go ahead and do this. Um, what can we do, though? I mean, you mentioned at the very end, well, we should support what's going on in Washington, but on a daily basis, what can we do uh, to address the many issues that you brought forth? So those are my two questions. Uh, and so what did the data say? Is this on? OK. Um, the data say that we've got the college cost problem is, got, is a revenue problem, and it's a spending problem. And we're not going to fix it by looking only at one half of it. Uh, it's a very different manifestation depending on different types of institutions, so we can't expect uh, the diagnosis of a private research university to apply to a community college. So the data say, all right, the data say we've got to be more nuanced in this conversation. The data say that we've got a public policy problem and an institutional spending problem. Uh, in public institutions, the, the, the habits of state funding and the patterns of state appropriations are a big part of the problem. Um, and we can say a lot more about that, but that's a piece of it. But I also think there's an institutional piece of it, which has to do with the way that institutions spend the money that they have. And spending habits in institutions that are too frequently on autopilot, where fixed costs, uh, employee benefits and other things are the first priority for spending and where we are not doing as much as we need to to connect data about spending to putting it in places that make a difference in student effectiveness. So that's what the data say. Regarding what we can do, first of all, I heard the comment, and I appreciate Bob Sharman's comment about K-12. Um, we're in this with the public schools. California has decimated their schools worse fast, much faster, we're in the same pattern of what they're doing to higher education. And uh, when Kentucky has better tax effort in support of its children in California, we need to rethink what we're doing. Um, I Personally, I've never seen so many portable facilities. My kids go to the public schools in Long Beach. They do an outstanding job. But California's student-to-teacher ratio is 39 to 1. The national average is 23 to 1. Think about that for in a kindergarten classroom. And so number one is we're not in this to blame our public schools. We've got to work with them. And we have to provide these are opportunities that are absolutely essential for our kids and our students. And we've got to work our way out of this together. Uh, number two, I'm a little pessimistic about what this state actually is committed to. Um, the state put more money into Medicaid. Why? Because there was a federal match while hammering higher education with a 30% budget reduction. I think that we have to advocate for greater federal intrusion, greater federal involvement, and in many ways put our states in handcuffs to make sure they're not doing the wrong things over and over and over again and shifting that burden to the federal government. And it may be in the form of federal matches, it may be in the form of maintenance of effort provisions that apply to virtually any, I, I would put all $170 billion in the federal monies, I would use that as the leverage. Federal leverage works. Number two, you know, it was the Democrats. Without federal leverage, it was the Democrats who threw higher education under the bus last year. And 
you can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, but we have legislators that are on both sides of the aisles. Every one of them say that they're supportive of education. It's one of their top three priorities. And every one of them are the first to sign on to budgets that have decimated our public schools and are in the process of decimating higher education. So I would hold them to their votes, not their words, to their votes. And we need to advocate for people who are willing to raise revenues for K-12 schools and children and, and to look outside the state of California to realize that it shouldn't be very flattering for, this, for a state this wealthy to be well behind West Virginia and its tax effort for children and students. And that needs, we need a wake-up call on this. We need an important wake-up call because it's ultimately everybody's, everybody's at stake in this. The economy, the future economy of this state, our student opportunities. We are in danger of becoming the only generation in the history of America to leave the next generation with less educational opportunity and a lower standard of living. That should be a, a, enough of a wake-up call to get people to understand the difference between a state investment, which is a school, and a child and a student, and a state expenditure, which is a three strikes and you're out incarceration. And I spend more time telling legislators, would it make a difference if I were to incarcerate a number of our students? Would we get more money? <laughs> but the, as sad as that is to say, that's where we are right now. Fullerton, Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Long Beach, we get about $4,500 per student from this state, and we're incarcerating people at $55,000 per year per person at the state level. And that's not the elderly, that's just an average. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to questions from the audience. Uh, we have a roving mic here, so we already have a, our question. Please ask, uh, first say who your question is for. Um, uh, this, question, this question is for both of you. Is this loud? Um, I was very discouraged by President Obama's speech on January 27th where he said that university uh, tuitions were going to be pegged to uh, federal aid, that if tuitions were not kept where they are or brought down, federal aid would be cut, and I'd like to know what your opinion is, both of you. That's for Kay. I'm very supportive of what he said, and what he said before that, before he said, he said two things. We're going to hold states accountable, which I showed you the charts, that's page three and four, and we're going to hold institutions accountable for doing the right things. There are many institutions that aren't doing the right things, that are called in a cold war of spending growth, that then turn to the federal government to match their spending growth and tell the federal government that it's your fault you're not keeping up with our spending growth. So I think it's about time that the federal government has we're all going to lose in this if something isn't done ultimately. And there are, as I mentioned, 178 for-profits in California. Many of those for-profit institutions gauge their tuition based on how much student aid they can get at the state and federal level. So if the aid keeps going up, their tuition keeps going up, the system keeps putting more pressure to lose money, we're all going to lose on this. Because if something isn't done and it's so lucrative to get into this business, I'm going to start Alexander University in the industrial park <laughs> and raise tuition as the money is made available without any regard to student loan debt, indebtedness, or default rates. So I think it is the first step that we have gone in the last 30 years of higher education where we have spent 30 years simply saying, are we going to increase Pell or not? Or are we going to increase a loan cap or not? Without any regard to the fact that those are tuition-based assistance programs. And I think the federal government has a, has a solid right and a responsibility to use the leverage to make sure institutions are behaving appropriately with public money. I have to say, I was, I was very disheartened by the, by the Washington and much of the national reaction to the president's proposals, which was very much um, a status quo protective response uh, and a, a response that this is a one-size-fits-all federal regulatory intrusion into higher education. Um, and, I, and I'm afraid that the assumption in, is that these proposals that have been put forward and w for which the, the, the administration asked for uh, help in thinking about it, 
they asked for ways to, to, to do this responsibly, and what they got back was, was a, uh, a, a slam door. So I'm, I, I, was, I, was, I was very disappointed. I have problems with the, with the language of any tuition increase results in control, since so much of the tuition increases in public institutions are happening uh, to backfill for budget cuts. Um, so I think the math matters. I think the details matter. The symbology of it, King's got it exactly right, in my opinion. Next question. I'm back here. Uh, King, Garcia. we've had this discussion, but how do we control the for-profits? Having come from states where they're very highly regulated and the states close them, how do we in California do that? Well, one, one reason California has got, you know, California has gotten like Florida, like Arizona. New York did a better job. New Jersey, New Jersey does a better job. You've been in New York. Um, most don't go to New Jersey, for, for example. Um, uh, the California was supposed to regulate this, and at some point just completely abdicated these responsibilities to an outside accrediting body. And... To, to show you how bad accrediting has become, just in WASC, our accrediting association for Foot, Cal State Fullerton and Long Beach, take a look at who you're accredited alongside of, who the board members are from. WASC, which is one of the most respected accrediting bodies, uh, Cal State Fullerton's vote counts the same as Patton University in Oakland. Patton University in Oakland is a not-for-profit, but the vice president of academic affairs, the vice president of student services, and the provost are all sisters in the same family. They have the same accreditation as Stanford. So we have actually, accreditation, first of all, hasn't handled this. So when California said, we're not going to do it either, nobody has been controlling this. And in fact, all you need is a simple accreditation from one of six as it started, and now there are 30 accrediting bodies. Um, I think you restrict the funding. I, I do think the best way possible is for the states to gain control over this. It's a consumer protection issue as much as it is anything else. The, the Council on Post-Secondary Education in Kentucky had this responsibility to approve of any university in the state. They've forgotten that it's their responsibility. You know, when you leave the United States, the ministries of education, the landers in Germany, they can, they're the ones that approve whether you can operate in their country, in their region, and it is a government issue. We're the only OECD country that has said that we're going to turn over $170 billion to private accrediting bodies that then can go into states that have no regulation whatsoever. So a good piece of the governor's proposal, this is sort of the good side of what I think the Cal Grant discussion is going, is that the governor and the staff saw how these numbers were progressing. They believed the idea that why are there 178 already operating, getting tons of money? Next year, there'll be 300. So they said that in their proposal, in the governor's proposal, they said nobody gets more than a CSU student except a UC student. But no private or for-profit will get more than the $4,000 limit. I think states have got to get engaged in this. The issue coming out of Washington is that we need to adopt state regulation and state authorities that do this. The federal government is putting pressure on us to do this right now. Accreditation has taken a stand against state regulation. Well, we tried, the federal government tried this in the Clinton administration in the early 1990s. If you remember, if you remember the spree discussion, right. higher education unified and said, we don't want oversight. Well, we've got a problem that we can't reel in now because we didn't have appropriate oversight. I think the state has a responsibility to have one of its agencies, consumer protection, or somewhere, someplace, there is appropriate oversight on who can offer degrees in the state and who actually is allocated public money based on a whole different set of transparency agreements, accountability agreements, and other things. I agree with you, King. I think we as a CSU system should start working together to ensure the state starts taking over. I agree completely. But I, I want to add one other thing in this that Bob Sharman mentioned. This is one of his uh, comments. California has, uh, has, has effectively dismantled policy capacity for post-secondary education. Um, and it's 
The only place there's any kind of capacity now is the Student Aid Commission, which is not well constituted to play an oversight or policy role. It's a funding agency. King's a little bit more ready than I am to federalize aspects of higher ed policy. Um, in a fantasy, I'd like to see the, the federal government do some things they're not doing, but I think, I think for a lot of reasons, we've got to continue to have the states in the game of setting public policy expectations for higher ed, of, of keep making sure that the funding is appropriate, uh, and we don't have it in California, you don't have it in California. And uh, the, 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 the dismantling of CPEC last year, I've heard described as a mercy killing, and, and certainly it was something that, that took a long time to happen, and it needed to happen. California needs to have that conversation. Historically, people in Cal State have not been eager to have a high-functioning CPEC. So I think I, I understand why you have that history, but I think you've got to get in a different mindset for the future. You've got to come around creating a high-functioning, capable um, post-secondary body to do the licensure and to do the state policy and to do the planning. Otherwise, you're defaulting to the legislative analyst. And they're good people, but they've got a different job to do. Their job is to protect the budget. You got a different job. Next question. I'm a student at Cal State Fullerton, and I appreciate the fact that you talked about, that both of you have talked about that we are paying more money and receiving less services. Our classes are bigger. Our faculty is absolutely, completely weighed down by their inability to be able to take all of us on. And they are trying their best and doing what they can. And I have seen faculty members who have gone out of their way to take care of their students and to make sure that their students not only succeed, but are able to participate in the global market and to be the best in whatever field that they are. I mean, we have the most amazing faculty. And student issues are faculty issues, and faculty issues are student issues. We are linked to each other, and we have to have each other. And I appreciate that you brought those things up. One of the things that I see that is in neither one of your presentation is the third element to all of our universities at this point, which is the administration. Mm. Where is the data on them and their participation and also their responsibility in dealing with these issues? Because they weren't even brought up, and that's one of the things that we as students find very frustrating. They raised our tuition by 9%, and within five minutes had also raised the salary of a president of a university. And so we found that very frustrating and something that we didn't understand. And so the fact that administration didn't even come up in either one of your presentations is kind of confounding and a little bit irritating to us as a student population. Well, I've got another two million charts we can go through. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, the, the data on spending for administration versus academics we've got, and it's the source of some of my comments about you see greater evidence of suppression in spending on the instructional side than elsewhere. Having said that, I don't think in most public institutions in Cal State, again, there's a smoking gun issue on administrative expenses, overwhelming academic expenses. Uh, I th and certainly a lot, if you look at where the money goes, more money's going into student services. I think that's good money. I think it should be going there. More money's going into academic support, which means computing centers. So it's, there's, there's pressure outside of the instructional line. I also would say the, you know, the, the money that's going into presidential salaries, the symbology is bad. You take that money and roll it up, it's not gonna buy you anything. You do need good leaders and you do, do need good presidents in, in any institution. I think one of the big problems we got in higher ed is the quality of leadership and the fact that too many people that we want to have in those jobs won't take them. So I'm not going to back away from saying you've got to pay people decent salaries. These are impossible jobs. I don't know why, I mean, well, he's not, he's not a balanced person, you can tell. I mean, why would you? <laughs> Why would you want these? These are, these are very tough jobs, so I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna sign up for, for making that the problem. I, I think the problem is, as I said, much more nuanced than that, um, and, um, and, the, and you, there is just not evidence that this is the thing that's driving money up. Money's going all by itself. And if you do dissect the data, even down to what Jane's talking about, what you'll find is among the largest, that collection of the largest institutions over 100, we spend less on instruction for students. We spend less on ENG for students. We spend less on administration for students. 
we don't have any, we don't have the resources that our institution other institutions have and so we're on the low end and you can argue isn't that greatly efficient but that also means we're not we don't have the resources we don't get the revenues and the flip side of that and I'll throw this in the into the equation if you take a look at on the high end of spending the high end of those institutions that I mentioned the ones that spend the most per student what you'll find are four or five UCs um, in terms of large institutions. So I am very much encouraged to, for others to use these data to dissect into those questions. And one other point, don't let legislators deflect the attention of what they have done to you and us. These are gimmicks, these are games that have no impact on the budget. They're trying to get your support by putting together a student scholarship bill. After they cut the budget by 30% and are in the process of cutting the CSU by 35%, $950 million. They would love for us to cannibalize ourselves and fight amongst ourselves because then they can get reelected. This is about their decisions their lack of priority in children, their lack of priorities in our students, and their lack of priority in the future of California. Hold them accountable and don't let them find scapegoats for this. I was going to add a little bit to that. I, and how many faculty are in the room? How many administrators are in the room? How many administrators are in the room? How many administrators in the room? Um, I've been on both sides of the aisle. I, I'm not going to say much more than that. Uh, <laughs> administrators work very hard. Whether their salaries worth, that's a big question. But let's go to the next question. <laughs> uh, I'd like to follow up on that issue of administration because starting in 1990, uh, all across higher education, the administration began to grow at about 8% a year, and that continued for many years. It slowed down somewhat recently. But uh, as faculty lines got shifted to part-timers, administration started to grow very rapidly, more rapidly than, than I think, healthcare costs. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of the things that used to be done by full-time faculty are not done by part-time faculty. So you think you save some money by hiring part-timers, but you don't save that much because now you have to have much larger student services organizations where we used to have a dean of students. We now have a vice president uh, for student services with a whole retinue of staff. Uh, clearly, uh, administration doesn't account for a big percentage of the university's budget uh, across higher education, but it, it accounts for more than it needs to, and we need to be efficient in that area, in my opinion. Well, I absolutely agree we need to be efficient, and we need to be looking at where every dime gets spent to put it where it has the most value. I actually think that there's an argument to be made that there's a higher value for putting student support services in professional student service offices than asking faculty to do the counseling, to do the advising, to do the financial aid packaging that goes along with the student service title. I don't think that's what faculty ought to be doing. Uh, that's probably not what they're good at. I would like to see much more great, much greater faculty involvement in, um, in, in curriculum uh, development and in uh, thinking about student uh, experiences and in teaching and learning. So I, this is not meant to say all of this can be done by non-faculty. We've got to keep faculty in the game. The data on administrative expenses going up 8% per year, I haven't seen it. Um, it's certainly not in, in, in the institutions that you're sitting inside, certainly not in most of them. The people who have some of those numbers have thrown everything in the kitchen sink in that administrative number. So anything other than faculty salaries, they call administration. So they're counting, they're counting hospital expenditures. They're counting athletic expenditures. We haven't gotten into athletics. Let's, let's, that's another juicy topic. Um, and, and they're, so there's a, not, there's a lot of funny stuff in those numbers. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure I buy it. I do buy, I've said, 
that we, when you look at the, at the patterns and where the money is coming from, we're suppressing instructional spending more than, than other areas. That's a fact on its face. And I'll comment that for the institutions that remain engaged in public missions, the ones that still take 36%, 34%, 30% in Fullerton's case, Pell eligible students, student services are absolutely vital. And let, let me give a statistic that at least I know the Secretary of Education has used on occasion. The Ivy League, there are eight universities in the Ivy League. They have $80 billion collective endowment. They spend more than anybody else per student in the world. They have 7,200 first generation or Pell students amongst all of them. Cal State Fullerton has 10,000. We have 13,000. Northridge has 16,000. Just our individual institutions alone. They don't need the student services that we need. We have to do things that we wish we wouldn't have to do. We have to offset a 39 to 1 student teacher ratio in the high school. We have to offset the fact that my kids go to the smallest high school in Long Beach. They have 4,500 kids. That's bigger than a vast majority of the universities in America. Uh, we have to do things to help our students succeed, and a lot of that has to do with student services. Having said that, I am willing, and I've looked at the data. I want the data out there. I want everybody to use these data and stack it up and compare. Stack it up and compare, and what you're going to find is that we're not only underfunded, we're underspending on everything that we do with our students, whether we're helping them the ways we need to, we don't have the resources. So I, before you buy into what, what, I know Jeff's here, Salingo, what some other institutions are doing that you may read about in the Chronicle, pay close attention and do comparisons. This data makes, makes those comparisons possible and available. And I encourage you all to look. I think our faculty do, as a student said, an, an, an amazing job. I don't know how our faculty in the CSU are getting done what we're getting done. And in fact, that's why we were invited to the White House. That's why we went to Washington and spoke to other institutions about getting stuff done that they can't even fathom we're getting done. So I just don't know where the breaking point ultimately is. Uh, I hear rumbling stomach, stomachs, so we have to keep moving along. We have time for one more question, and let's hope it's a good one. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you have any <coughs> proposals, particularly since we may see a ballot measure coming up, for tying our higher education needs in specifically with any tax changes, new, maybe new changes, or that perennial question of revising Prop 13, or any other ideas for higher education specific tax measures? The short answer is no. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't think that we should only be talking about revenues. Um, I think we need to talk about budget reform. That, I, mean, I think that the conversation in California about the, the fact that the legislature and the governor don't have the authority to make decisions about the allocation of resources um, and is, is a serious one. Um, and, and, and for them to be accountable for making decisions about how those resources are spent, they need to have the authority to do it, and those, and, and those have incrementally passed away from them. Um, California is still a pretty high tax state, I, 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 and, and the, the money is, is there someplace in California. It's in corrections, it's in Medicaid, um, it's, it's not in higher education, it's not in the schools. So I think that the budget needs to be reprioritized. I also think we need to be looking within, Cal within higher education about different ways to spend the money we have. I'm not sure I go to where King is to say every single dime we spent is, is underspending and more efficient. Even the least well-financed community colleges, California, perfect case in point, they're spending proportionately more on administration in community colleges than, than they should be. It's because they're fragmented. They, they, we aren't taking advantage of efficiencies and systems that we should be. So I, I, I think we need to be looking at ways to, to, to leverage the money um, and not just be talking about revenues. Budget solution, absolutely. Um, should we be allocating more money to higher education? Absolutely. Do we need a tax increase to get there? I'm not sure. 
but I haven't lived in California for many years. Maybe it's different. In some some states, that is that is Texas that has helped. Um, in, in California, it, it's always not what's face value, though. Um, you know, the oil severance tax is a good idea, uh, but the question ultimately was who's controlling that? Who actually is, does that take the power away from the regents and the trustees to allocate it broadly to all the sis, the system institutions? And there are good ideas that are floating forward, um, but I, this state, you know, I'm not just saying this, um, but the, the economist said California is worse than Greece because Greece was never on top of the European Union. Um, it is the most dysfunctional democracy. I've been in six states uh, on earth, according to the economist. Um, I would second that. This two-thirds vote has stymied this state from reacting with people who want to support education has shut this state down, is almost seeking a consensus to get anything done. And then, for the hard decisions, for us to have to wait to make a budget that starts July 1 for a November election to determine whether we're going to be cut another 10% uh, is completely dysfunctional in terms of how you manage a state and how a state progresses. This has become the, one of the world's biggest dysfunctional democracies. And I think complete reform in what's going on. There are only three states that do a two-thirds vote. Arkansas, Rhode Island, and you know, Rhode Island is as big as Anaheim. <laughs> uh, so I wouldn't count it. Uh, but th this state does not work. You know, I, I'll say this. I think a part-time legislature is needed. They're up there year-round, not passing budgets, not passing them on time. And there, we had to kill 28 bills last year just to keep our ability to react to what they're going to do to us because they're thinking up ways. A part-time legislature worked pretty well in Kentucky when they had to get back to work because they had to get back to work after three months and they passed a budget and they made sure that we had a budget that we knew would start July 1 that we had to get ready for. Five of the six years that I've been in California, we have not had a budget prior to the fiscal year that we started in. So I think that structurally, California is broken and needs a significant reforms at the governmental level. And tying it, I think the tax discussions would be the next step. Where do we go with that? But I think structurally, we've got some major issues and major problems that we all know. We all know. Our uh, next week's topic will be education and politics. <laughs>